As the combine comes to the close, chatter in Indianapolis suggests the Bengals will franchise tag Jesse Bates and will be in the interior offensive line market. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Thanks for making us your first listen here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day, free and available everywhere you get your podcast. We've got you covered with Bengals news analysis and more all year, five days a week, baby, every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And James, where we're going to start today is with more Jesse Bates news. This isn't necessarily groundbreaking stuff, let's mm-hmm. say. But Tyler Dragon, who formerly covered the Cincinnati Bengals for the Cincinnati Inquirer, of course, reporting over the weekend that the Bengals are on track to franchise tag jesse Mm -hmm. bates and loyal listener the bengalorian also pointed out on twitter that jesse bates favorited a tweet as as we're in social media watch season james bates favorited a tweet yesterday's price isn't today's price and so the saga and the drama continues yeah and he removed bangles from part of his social media and you know everybody's on that look he's getting franchise tagged and that's that's something we knew it was the most likely outcome weeks ago. We said it here, and that's why you listen to Locked On Bengals. So you get that insight because that was always the most likely scenario. It's probably going to happen, barring something unforeseen over the next couple of days before that March 8th deadline. And that isn't a bad thing. That That's the thing. Like with negotiations here, I get it. You want Bates to get his money, but we just we don't know how these talks are going, what the talks are like, uh, what Bates is agent and, and Bates, what they're asking for, what the Bengals are offering. And so it, it, it kept coming back to every time I thought about potential paths for a deal, well, the Bengals have the franchise tag in their back pocket and they have the tag in the back pocket. And that and so um, I, I think that's the, the most likely outcome. We'll see if they can get a deal done. I'm, I'm still open to the idea of that happening before that July 15th deadline. But yeah, I mean, I, I could have told you this, uh, you know, that this was the most likely scenario and we did here. And um, I think it's OK. Like, I don't think it's the end of the world that Jesse Bates is getting tagged. I also understand why it would be ideal in a perfect world for both sides to, to reach a long term deal. And so they'll have, uh, what, four months plus to do that after they tag him later this week. Yeah, the the actual tweet was, to to clarify this a little bit, the Bengals are likely going to franchise tag Jesse Bates as they continue to try to negotiate a long-term extension with the safety. This is exactly what, you're right, we've been saying on this podcast for weeks now. I guess it's only been weeks because the Bengals were in the Super Bowl, you guys might remember. And and so the offseason started late. But the... The thing that I'm highlighting here, the reason that I'm reading the full tweet that that amounts to his report is that it's while they're trying to negotiate a long-term extension. And it it probably comes down to the way the contract is going to be structured. And maybe there's some differences in terms of the money being offered versus the money being received. Maybe the Bengals are still, you know, he's not a Pro Bowl safety. Maybe they're still bringing that stuff up and... Maybe it's more it's more contentious than we thought, but I would say that there's almost zero chance that the Bates doesn't play at least the 2022 season with the Bengals. And a friend of the show, Andre Perota, also points out that he thinks the holdup in the Bates negotiation is a lack of guarantees outside of the the signing bonus. Mm-hmm. And this is something that we've also talked about with the Bengals is the way they do contracts, the way they structure deals has been an impediment to them in the past. And this is something that has come up more with external free agents and internal free agents. But uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next segment when we talk more about how the Bengals are becoming a little bit of a destination. And that's been the chatter in Indianapolis. It was an issue with Carl Lawson. He he didn't like that the only guarantee he got was the signing bonus. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to do a deal in that structure. And so he left. And so 
that has been an issue for the Bengals in the past. You could probably go back to other free agents that they've had, and and that's probably been the core at some of these issues. But you would think that with the again, I mean, we we've said this a lot with the opportunity they have, the position they're in, Joe Burrow on his rookie deal for a few more years. This would be a time to to really go for it and, and maximize the window, and so that is the onus on the Bengals front office this offseason, and it can and it has been you know, since we started talking about it. For sure. And that's the thing is obviously the Bengals, if they're going to make another run, you want Jesse Bates to be a part of it because he makes them that much better. He raises their ceiling. He can hide flaws and make plays and all of those things that we saw in the postseason. And, uh, you know, the guaranteed structure, it's coming to an end. And here's why it's coming to an end, because there's a Joe Burrow in town. So at some point, they're going to have to tweak what they do contracts wise. It might, it might not be until Burrow, but it's it's going to happen. There's no way, uh, in my eyes. I don't know what you think, but I, I if you're Burrow, you, you can ask for the moon and the stars, the sky, yeah. and everything in between. And so that's the tick 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 time clock that Katie Blackburn, Mike Brown, the Bengals front office that they're working against. And so, do they press fast forward almost on that clock and say, all right, we're going to start structuring these deals different now and that that is only uh we're only going to find that out in free agency we're not going to find that out until then unless they do get a bait steal done between now and that that march 8th deadline but uh it's certainly going to be a factor and um the last thing you want as you mentioned carl lawson is that to get in the way of insert whatever veteran free agent that you want to add let alone a guy that you've drafted and developed now in baits i mean Look, they, they upgraded from Carl Lawson because of, of Trey Hendrickson. You're right. Hendrickson was great, but you're not always going to get that luck. If you let Bates walk, it's not like you're going to find the, the an upgraded version of Bates and free agency. Much, much harder to do, especially, like I said, if they continue to, to structure their contracts and their deals the way they do. And it is a good group at safety and free agency, but mm-hmm. you're talking about you're either paying $16 million a year anyway to a guy like Marcus Williams or Tyran Matthew if you're trying to get into one of those markets, or you're taking a downgrade in a guy like Jordan Whitehead or Quan- C- Andre? Q- Andre? Q- Andre? Diggs. Diggs. Or Marcus yep. May. Yeah, sorry. I butchered the name there pretty good, but... Um, you know, we, we started looking ahead at free agency a little bit and there are some other good safeties there, but if they let Bates walk, you're setting yourself back a little bit because you have a guy that you can just keep that's familiar with the system and you don't have to gamble on locker room fit or scheme fit or any of these things. And you just get a guy who you know well and who knows you well. And, and that is the frustrating part of this is like, just get the thing done. That remains the sentiment I would say among Bengals fans is like, why is this so hard? And and now you're starting to see some Bengals fans saying like, okay, why is Jesse Bates being so unreasonable? But it is pretty common for NFL agents to seek guaranteed money and for NFL players to seek guaranteed money. Other sports have fully guaranteed contracts. In football, you know, guys like Ezekiel Elliott sign these $100 million deals and they won't see the last three years of the deal. And it's like, it looks great up front. You think you have all this money coming to you and it's a lot, but then you don't see 40% of the money. And so yep. that's why they're looking for these guarantees outside of the signing bonus, because even though most players historically see their full contract in Cincinnati and they've got that track record, it's not all of them anymore. They've started cutting players prematurely more so than they did in the past. The devil's advocate to that devil's advocate is the Bengals do more in terms of practical guarantees. And, and so like, the fully guaranteed versus a practically guaranteed is something that for me is a bit of a sticking point when I think about it from the agent and player perspective. Like if you're going to have a $15 million signing bonus, you're going to see the first three years of that deal for sure. And maybe you want me to guarantee the second year salary so that you feel better about getting the full guarantee, but it already is practically guaranteed. You're not going to get cut and take a negative $2 million cap hit for cutting a player early it, 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 you know what I mean? So like that, that mm-hmm. is roughly guaranteed salary. So hopefully it gets done. The saga continues. We'll probably see a franchise tag. As you said, James, the deadline coming up this week, we're recording this on Sunday, March 6th. So we'll see what happens there. But while the Bengals work on Jesse Bates, 
The news in Indianapolis is that the Bengals will be active in the interior offensive line market, and they're going to be an attractive place for people to go. More reporting suggesting that Joe Burrow has made the Bengals a free agency destination. We'll get into that coming up next. Speaking of being attractive, it's almost beach season, Jake. It's warm in Cincinnati today. It's like 70 plus degrees and you got a vacation coming up probably. I know I haven't scheduled mine yet. At some point, I'm going to go on vacation here after the longest NFL season, uh, longest season in NFL history. And so when you want to get in shape, you got to get Built Bar, the number one protein bar on the planet, high in protein, low in sugar, low in carbs and calories and perfect for you. And the best part, well, they taste amazing. They're covered in 100% chocolate. Look at Jake's Built Puff. If you uh, if you are watching on YouTube and if not, well, you should subscribe on YouTube, even if you listen wherever you get your podcast and you also need to check out built bars right now i have one daily jake just got a fresh shipment in the lisco household to get yours go to built.com use promo code lock 15 you're going to get 15 percent off your order again get the best protein bar on the planet and get 15 percent off right now with promo code lock 15 at built.com james we talked last week about a mm-hmm. quote from Doug Kayed from PFF, and apologies if I've mispronounced his name as well, that was specifically a prominent tight ends agent, a free agent tight ends agent, wanted his client to go play for the Bengals. Dan Graziano and Jeremy Fowler of ESPN did their combine update today. That that got posted on Sunday morning, and one of the top stories is about the Bengals. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the Bengals just played in the Super Bowl from the AFC. So it makes sense that they would be getting a little bit more run in national media. But they wrote, here's the thing that would have sounded silly two combines ago. Free agents really want to play for the Bengals. Joe Burrow has changed everything about that franchise and players want to go play with him. Mm -hmm. This is ESPN writing this. This is Jeremy Fowler and Dan Graziano. These guys are connected. They were in Indianapolis. They were talking to agents. This is more affirmation, James, to, I think this was our our Friday show, the title of the Friday show. Joe Burrow has made the Bengals a free agency destination. And the more evidence we get piling up in this direction, and there's more from this article that I think is worth touching on, the, the more I'm kind of hoping for fireworks a little bit. In, in this upcoming free agency period. Yeah, I think there needs to be fireworks, right? You need to be able to to use this momentum that you have and take advantage of it and, and try to land some, you know, the right fish. I don't need necessarily all the big fish. I need the right fish. And the Bengals have been really good in free agency at doing that. Well, now they're as appealing as they've ever been uh, as, as far as free agency goes. Maybe ever, maybe in franchise history. Like, I, I, I don't think that's insane to say or yeah. prisoner of the moment type talk. And Free agency so, is relatively new, so I think you're probably right. Continue. It, yeah, it, it's so you have that. You have this quarterback that people are like, man, look at this dude. And so we'll see, you know, who they go after. There, You know, there's a, a ton of reports right now circling, uh, you know, Ryan Jensen, Bradley Bozeman, who we talked about a, a few weeks back on the podcast. So two veteran centers that the Bengals interested in veteran centers that, uh, you know, they're uh, open. And this was the vibe at the combine that, that they're they're leaning towards releasing or, or cutting Trey Hopkins and saving six million dollars against the cap, which would be from a cap standpoint would make sense, because if you're paying Ryan Jensen 13 million per, well, that that makes that a little easier to swallow this year, especially. And so um yeah, they uh, it, the, the interesting thing we talked about the contract structures, and I, I know we're going to talk about some of the the interior linemen. Well, historically, the Bengals haven't paid guards, and that's the, that's the part to me. What tier of guard do they end up going after, and how much are they? You know, are they willing to go after the James Daniels, who's probably going to make ten, you know, double digit millions uh, on average, or, or or someone like that, or do they go? The Austin Corbett route, or where do they go? Like, where is it on the priority list? I think it should be really high, of course. But this is the same team that did not pay Kevin Zeitler last offseason when they could have got a familiar face that they drafted and brought him back into the organization. So 
um, some younger guys that are out there that they uh, might be more willing to, to pony up for. So we'll see what they do. But it is exciting. And it's good to hear everything that you think, right, that Joe Burrow's making it a destination. It seems like we're almost getting hit over the head with it now because there's so many people uh, talking about that and agents talking about it. And then you have this report here from ESPN from Jeremy Fowler and Dan Graziano as well. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that where there's smoke, there's probably fire at some point. <laughs> and I think, I think we've passed that point. The interesting thing to me is the next paragraph after they write, free agents really want to play for the Bengals, they mention the contract structure issues. So this is how you know it's coming from agents, right? Is it it's, it's agents that are looking at it like, yeah, their antiquated contract structure guarantees players nothing beyond the signing bonus. That's why they lost Carl Lawson. They better not do that with my guys because my guys need to get that guaranteed money is probably how those conversations went. But in the same uh, article, they're talking about the Bengals being interested in the guard market headlined by Lake and Tomlinson from the 49ers. And they mentioned Austin Corbett from the Ra- uh, not the Rams. Yes, the Rams. Yeah, the Rams. Yes, the Rams. Yeah, the Rams. Sorry. Um, as as another guard candidate, you talked about James Daniels as another guy, the, one of the youngest free agents overall in this class. Connor Williams, also very young, just a few months older. Uh, but a, a clear step down, I think, there in how the NFL perceives those guys. The other one, and we've talked about it, you mentioned Bozeman, is Ryan Jensen, who apparently is – has drawn interest. We, we saw Jason Light has said, we're going to do everything we can to bring Jensen back. Mm-hmm. So maybe we need to temper our expectations of, of Jensen becoming a free agent next week. But in addition to that, apparently the Jets are very interested in a center mm-hmm. and the Jets can probably throw money at the problem, but also the Ravens, Steelers and Bengals listed in Dan Graziano's list of, of teams interested in Ryan Jensen. And, Jeremy Fowler also reporting the Bucks are going to try really hard to get something done. Touching on a number, 15 million. 15 million a year for Jensen is a number that Fowler mentions. And honestly, that might not be a number the Bengals are willing to go to. Maybe 13 million. Mm-hmm. And then you wonder, well, what's the difference of $2 million when, when you're already that high? But it's something that the Bengals have not been willing to do in the past. Yeah, it's... um. It's one of those things where, yeah, th- there's there's going to be a lot of competition. And, you know, Bradley Bozeman, for example, right? Everyone kind of says $10 million. Well, he may get 12. Like, that, that's the thing. When you play in free agency, it's almost like uh, in fantasy football, if you have these auction drafts, you have this number in your head that you're willing to go on certain guys. And you always end up having to usually pay more, uh, especially early in the draft when everyone has capital. Well, there's gonna, a lot of teams that are going to be aggressive here and try to add these proven guys. And that's how it is with free agency, especially offensive line. And so the Bengals have to be prepared for that and and understand that, yeah, they may have X number in their, their minds, but it may, they may have to go a little bit higher if they want that specific guy. And, you know, 15 million for Ryan Jensen, maybe they hold firm at 13 and say, all right, do you want to uh, block for Blaine Gabbert or whoever the, the bucks get at quarterback with uh, Tom Brady retired or, Again, you go back to the start of this segment. Do you want to play with Joe Burrow? Do you want to block for Joe Burrow? And um, that matters. Like there are guys that might be willing to take less if it's still a lot, right? 15 versus 13. Well, it's close. Now staying in Florida and that, you know, uh, having no income tax there, that would be uh, quite nice for Ryan Jensen as well. So that's uh, another factor and something yeah. that helps the Bucks for sure. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned Trey Hopkins, a buzz around the combine being that he's likely to be cut. Paul Daner Jr. wrote this in his athletic review of the 68 guys on the roster at the end of the year. Parting ways, the categorization for Trey Hopkins, Riley Reef, and Fred Johnson. So he's not expecting Riley Reef to be back. But there is a bit of a question as to whether Riley Reef wants to continue to play football as well. Is, is my read on the situation at this point? And Fred Johnson, we talked about when we, when we reviewed the restrictive free agents a few weeks ago is a guy that was a likely non-tender. And he also thinks that Deontay Smith might start at right tackle and Jackson Carmen is going to push to start next year. And so there's kind of the, these two sides of this on the one hand, it sounds like they're definitely going to be in the center market because mm-hmm. of this, that the way that is going with, with Trey Hopkins, the reports about Bozeman, the reports about Jensen, 
It also sounds like they're going to be in the guard market a little bit, or maybe a lot, but that's a little bit less clear because they've got these young guys who maybe they think are going to develop and take those steps. But the current reporting is that the Bengals will be part of the guard market, along with the Panthers, Vikings, Steelers, Jets, and Seahawks. So there you go. The Bengals listed with six teams who will be in the guard market, talking about Lake and Tomlinson, talking about Austin Corbett and all these guys. And so there we're starting to get the tears in, James. We, we've added a new participant to our free agency tier list and Mike at Bengal Sand Santagata. So we're going to have our, our consensus Bengals free agency board going soon, and we'll get those off-season plans coming pretty soon as well. But before then, talking about the Combine, James, crazy testing numbers this week. And I think we got to talk about that. Is this going to impact who the Bengals have available to them at 31? But football might be over. It's okay. Because the NBA is in full swing. It is March, which means college hoops in full swing as well. Did you see Duke going down to UNC over the weekend? I did. And you can wager on that game. You can wager on any game at betonline.net, whether it's pro hoops, college hoops, or maybe you want to switch gears and go the UFC route. There were fights on Saturday night. Maybe you want to wager on some boxing. Maybe you just want to wait until the draft and wager on that or get into some championship odds for the 2022 season before free agency starts. You can do all of that in one spot, betonline.net. I've used them. You should too. It's super easy and you can do it from your mobile device. They have a really uh, easy to use site that's right at your fingertips. All you got to do is go to betonline.net. You won't regret, regret it. They have the latest uh, odds, props, and so much more. Again, betonline.net, bet online, where the game starts. So, James, I, I don't know how have you been in the mock draft simulators very much yet? Have no. you gotten to that point? Not at all. Nope. Yeah. No, uh, so, I, I think maybe, maybe one, but um, not much because honestly, I'm in the free agency. Yep. It's time to wreak havoc on everybody by getting this dominant line and adding all these proven guys mode. Yeah. So keep going (laughs) for sure. For sure. I get that. And that's, you know, probably largely where the Bengals focus needs to be as well. But the combine has been going on, of course. And man, this is a particularly athletic class. It feels like more so than I was expecting. Certainly going from guys like Alec Pierce, who's like a 97th percentile athlete, at wide receiver to guys like Jordan Davis, who at 340 pounds ran a four, seven, five, 40. I mean, absolute freak Jordan Davis, but that was also true on the offensive line. Trevor Penning testing like a 98th, 99th percentile athlete was a guy that I think was, was a guy Bengals were hoping for. At 31, or at least their fans were hoping for at 31. Zion Johnson from Boston College, interior offensive lineman. Another one of those guys, I think, that Bengals fans are looking at at 31. Also tested really, really well. A lot of the edge guys that you might have hoped would fall to 31 if they do enough to address. Or or, or Devontae White, who I learned was 24. You know, all, all these guys testing great. And... When I went through and I tried to pick for every team, I did I did all 32 teams. I got to a point where there there wasn't a trench guy that I wanted at 31 for mm-hmm. the Bengals. And that's the impact of the combine validating some of the athletic stuff that you see on tape from some of these guys or surprising me. Like I did not I thought Alec Pierce was probably a above average athlete, you know, I didn't expect him to be an elite athlete with insane jumps. Right. And, and like, like Jamar chase level jumps, like an inch shorter for vertical and broad jump than Jamar chase and run a four, four 40. And you're seeing that for, I think a number of guys, linebacker, uh, defensive line and offensive line. Not that the Bengals are in the linebacker market, but it's, it's going to make things, I think, perhaps more challenging unless there's a run on quarterbacks that I currently don't foresee in the first round for the Bengals to get a guy that, you know, would be categorized as a faller at a position they want in the first round. And that's why the combine has been so interesting to me this year. 
Yeah, it's uh, so, so now you tie it together, right? And what we were just talking about, you got to be as aggressive as possible in free agency because of the uncertainty around 31 regardless, but especially now, because you might look up and they should go BPA, right? They, 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 it would be great, but you don't want to get caught reaching for an offensive lineman. And maybe it isn't at 31. Maybe it's not at 63, right? It, you know, if they're not the BPA there. And so uh, if, if you want to allow yourself to take the best player available, you're going to have to be aggressive leading up to the draft. The other aspect of this, and I don't want to completely rule it out because I think the Bengals would entertain it. The Laramie Tunsil part of it, I think it matters. If, if the Texans really do put him on the market, the Bengals will probably look and say, what offensive lineman can we get there anyway? And Frank Pollock last week talked about how they were, they wouldn't rule out moving Jonah Williams. Um, I, I'm not going to rule it out either. I'm, I'm not saying it's a likelihood or anything like that. It takes a lot to get a trade done in the NFL. Even small minor trades, not blockbuster trades like this would be. But uh, I think there's at least a path for that to, to happen now. And it maybe increases it a little bit because – who knows what the Texans, who knows what they're going to look for, but they're clearly rebuilding. They have a, a left tackle in waiting, essentially, and they have a guy who's clearly, in my eyes, clearly unhappy there. So, uh, no, I'm not talking about the Sean Watson. I'm talking about uh, Laramie Tunsil. So, yeah, we'll see if um, if that happens. But regardless, I think to your point, it might not be offensive line at 31, and they have to be prepared to fix that issue before – that that draft day when we're talking about potential options that could still be there after 30 picks. Yeah. And the, the other side of this is there, there were some guys that didn't perform as well as expected. Kenyon green is a big name. I think who is a seen as a very verse. We, we talked about him, I think with, with either Trevor or Mike or both Texas A&M. He, he played left guard this year, uh, played all over the offensive line for them. Did not have a very good combine. Didn't test well. Had issues in his drills to the point where like they were asking him to redo drills because they they were like such bad reps. Um, so so there is another side to it. The other guy that really made a name for himself is Cam Jurgens, who uh, the draft network described as day three Linderbaum going into the combine and and then tested crazy well. And mm-hmm. so there's a guy that maybe played his way into a, a day two consideration. Maybe you're maybe you're looking at him in the third round now. If it's not Tyler Linderbaum, and worth talking about Tyler Linderbaum too, because as we previously mentioned, the measurements weren't great. He didn't test. He's going to test at his pro day, but very very small. And and that was always going to be the knock on Linderbaum and thirty one in, in one eighth inch arms. I mean, whew. yeah, yeah. And, and so, the, you know, the, there was always – that was going to be, like, the, the scenario where he falls. But mm-hmm. it doesn't – like, the way this is setting up, we were talking about it before the show, it seems like the Bengals are ready to go sign a guy to a three-year contract at center. They're not expecting Linderbaum to be available to them. Or they've eliminated him from their draft board or, or, or from their first round board because of these limitations that, you know, maybe they have some some firm thresholds there. And I'm not saying they do or they don't, but – if they're going to go spend on a veteran center, I would not expect them to use their first round pick on a center as well. Yeah, it, it, it may seem unlikely, but what if they just assume he's going to be, you know, he's a top 15 player yeah. and they don't want to put themselves in the the position that they were in in 2018 when they clearly yeah. wanted a center and they're moving on from Russell Bodine and it's very clear that they're going to go that route. And well, guess what? Frank Ragnall went one pick ahead and that was going to be their pick one pick ahead of them. Uh, so if you address it in free agency, I mean, I wouldn't be against it. Like, let's say they signed Jensen, a 31 year old to a three year deal. If Linderbaum's the best player on the board, on their board, I'm not going to argue with them. Now, they need to have a plan. And is that plan really leaving the 31st pick on the bench for two years? Right. While Jensen plays, I, I don't necessarily think that's the right way to go about it but um you know there's probably a way to make that work if he's the top player on the board and i think he probably would be but you're right there's certain thresholds there's certain things that that these guys have to meet and who knows they may be scarred a little bit by price but if linderbaum tests the way he's supposed to and expected to at iowa's pro day i think a lot of those concerns will be eased and then he probably won't fall to 31 regardless 
Yeah, especially an offensive line in the trenches in general, you can overcome so much in terms of like physical size limitations with athleticism. Geno Atkins at six feet tall, right? 300 mm-hmm. pounds, not at the time seen as, as a guy who could play on the inside in the NFL and be consistently productive. And now we're looking at guys like uh, Aaron Donald at 280, 290, being the best interior players in the NFL because they're crazy athletes. And, and Geno was... Much the same, Devontae Wyatt, who I mentioned earlier, 24 years old, built and tested a lot like Geno. And so you, with, with guys like Raymond, Bernard Raymond from Central Michigan, and and uh, Devontae Wyatt, these 24-year-olds, you got to weigh in this age factor with them. And like, are they, are they dominating because they're older and because of the quality of competition? Now, not as much competition questions for Georgia, Devontae Wyatt, and the SEC, but Certainly a question for Raymond, who also has really good tape and really good athleticism. And so these these evaluations get really interesting. And and that's going to be something that we watch with this team is they're really missing athleticism still in a few spots. And I think interior defensive line is one of them. I think offensive line is one of them. And, And we've talked about the need for speed of wide receiver. And there are some really fun and really fast guys of wide receiver. Mentioned Alec Pierce earning himself some money this weekend, but Calvin Austin from Memphis, who I think we talked about with Trevor when, when you asked about the speedy wide receivers, mm-hmm. ran a 4-3-2. He's a little bit smaller, 5-7. So like Tavon Austin mold a little bit there, but a lot of athleticism at the receiver position as well. And so when the Bengals were looking that way in the mid rounds, which we've talked about, you know, I think I agree with you. I think they probably will. Uh, There are some athletes there for them to pick from. So really fun stuff for me. I I love this combine, especially because we're so behind. It's I'm learning about a lot of guys that I hadn't heard of before. Um, More, more than usual. There's always guys you haven't heard of that come out of nowhere at the combine. Cole strange or uh, the, the, the UCLA guard, um, who the Bengals met with, whose name I'm blanking on right now. I got it. Um, I wrote about him on Saturday for all Bengals. I'm I'm looking real quick. I've got I forget it. his name. John Ryan. Ryan. That's it. Sean yeah. Ryan, who who tested really well, by the way. Really uh, well. You, 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 you <laughs> learn about some of these guys, and and we the the list of offensive linemen. Just the last thing that the Bengals met with that that I've seen so far: Bernard Raymond, Zion Johnson, John Marie. J- Jamery Salyer, don't know how to say his first name yet. Sean Ryan, Vidarian Lowe from Illinois, who I've never heard of before. Daniel Falele from Minnesota and Cade Mays from Tennessee. Cade Mays also tested like a freak. So talking to some athletes and some very large men like Daniel Falele. And, and Ryan with an H. How yeah. about that? Love it. I love uh, silent H spellings. in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Give me, uh, give me that. So, no, they they certainly, and that's their vision, right? We we talked about Frank Pollock and when he said last week they want athletes and, and guys yeah. that can move, and uh, guys that can eat glass the way I eat built bars. So uh, hopefully they've they've found those guys not only in free agency and targets in free agency, but also in the draft. Because if they're going to fix the trenches, it's going to have to be hitting on both ends of it, so they can start to have a pipeline of offensive linemen that uh, are capable of playing. Yeah. And sorry, one quick correction. Cade Mays didn't test like a freak. I'm thinking of Cam Jurgens. I got those two guys confused, Cade and Cam. But he did test pretty well. 77th percentile athlete. Anyway, a lot more to dive into with the uh, the combine coming to a close with free agency nearly upon us and the offseason really in full gear now. Now that the combine, by the time you've listened to this, has finished. We, we'll talk about the defensive backs a little bit tomorrow as well. I'm a gardener. Sauce. Never smoked or drank in his life, according to interviews in, in the co- in in Indianapolis and four certainly five, positioning. Too. Did he did he run a four or five? Yeah, which is good for his size, man. <laughs> Be interesting to see what happens with this cornerback class. Kyler Gordon, another guy we're watching, and I think cornerback is in play at thirty one as well. Anyway, let's wrap up there, Bengals fans. The combine in the books, free agency a week away, draft to talk about, free agency to talk about, rumors flying. We'll have you covered with all the latest here on Locked on Bengals. Until next time, who day and have a good one.